we are in some way responsible for how we perceive things and for how we react to things. And yes, we inherit all this conditioning, just like I inherit a certain physical body. I inherit my social body, my myself, my model from my culture and, and my ancestors. But I'm also responsible for what I do with it. And I ought to be taught and empowered to affect it. And then I ought to use that power to make life better. And so when you find a place where the model isn't working, you know, what can you do to leverage a little bit of plasticity in that model and update it? And contemplative practices are one access point by which to challenge and, and update these models. Welcome to Mind and Life. I'm Wendy Hasenkamp. My guest today is neuroscientist and contemplative researcher Norm Farb. Norm is Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Toronto, where he studies the psychology of well-being, focusing on mental habits. He was one of the first people to study how meditation impacts our brains, and his broader work incorporates emotions, body sensations, and present moment awareness. He's been a key player in the field of contemplative science for more than a decade. I spoke with Norm last summer, and our conversation, as usual, covers a lot of ground. We start with his winding path into contemplative neuroscience, integrating computer engineering, philosophy, and psychology along the way. And then he shares a little about his initial study on meditation, which was quite seminal for the field, looking at how different ways of thinking about the self show up in the brain and how meditation changes that. Then Norm goes over some basics of predictive models of mind, something we talk about on the show quite frequently, and he unpacks how we're always either reinforcing or updating our model of the world. Here we get into some interesting implications for political polarization, and he even talks about the phenomenon of mansplaining. We discuss the default mode network in the brain and its role in cognition and maintaining these models of the world, and how meditation can help shift our habitual patterns. Then we get into interoception, or internal bodily sensations. And Norm shares how sensing the body might reduce conceptual processing in the brain. And we talk about how this plays into depression and how we can get stuck protecting ourselves from difficult feelings. This takes us into a discussion about the self as the current model of the world and the ethics of updating our self model in a responsible way. And we end with Norm's perspective on a number of brain-related topics, including how functions are localized versus distributed in the brain, and a really insightful commentary on the current state of brain research on meditation and how we should be thinking about that. There's actually lots more in here, too. This might be an episode worth a second listen if you're really into these topics. I so appreciate the breadth and depth of Norm's work and also his ability to distill these complex ideas down to what really matters. I'm reminded of a comment from a very well-established and brilliant neuroscience colleague when they were working with Norm on a big paper. They said, after listening to Norm explain it, I feel like I finally understand how brains work. That's an experience I can also relate to, including after having this conversation. You can find a link to that paper I just mentioned in the show notes, along with many other resources. And I'll just highlight a wonderful talk from Norm that nicely summarizes a lot of what we dig into in today's episode. This was his lecture from 2018 when he received the Kathy Kerr Award for Courageous and Compassionate Science. I highly recommend it. It's called How to Choose Between Beautiful Stories. Okay, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. It's my great pleasure to share with you Norm Farb. I'm so happy to be joined today by Norm Farb. Norm, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Wendy. It's a pleasure and a big fan of the podcast. Oh, thank you. Well, we're so happy to have you. I always like to start with a little background and understanding a little bit of how people came to be doing the work that they're doing today. So I'm curious for you um, how you came into the contemplative space and your interest in um, psychological and neuroscience research. Uh, yeah, I guess my super Spider-Man origin story was <laughs> I got bit by a radioactive nerd. Um, I think I always, you know, growing up as a sort of introspective kid and um, from an early age, I was quite curious about how the, the mind worked and, you know, why it was that we had even awareness at all. 
and uh, I actually went into computer engineering uh, after high school to try to get into AI. This would have been in the end of the 90s, um, but it was like a ton of math. And I was also learning about like not living at home and, um, you know, drinking and other substances. <laughs> and it wasn't the right time to be learning both things. So I ended up dropping out of computer engineering after a year and thinking, well, I'm still interested in this mind stuff, but I don't know if I can hack uh, the math side of it. And so why don't I get more into like the philosophy, psychology sort of stream? And so I ended up switching into an arts program and doing philosophy and psychology. Um, and I got caught up into the existentialist um, line of philosophy, which is all about the primacy of experience. And that really resonated with me. And at the same time, I was learning, you know, psych methods for how to maybe tractably test some of the ideas that come out of inquiring into your own first person experience, uh, which is mm -hmm. sort of like the beginning and end of, of existentialism, which is a little <laughs> un unsatisfying. And and uh, I also saw from my studies how it, it, it was not an incomplete methodology because you could never actually move beyond personal experience to things like social obligation from a pure existentialist perspective. Anyway, so I, I kind of lucked into finding a, an interesting intersection that could still apply to my interest in the mind that uh, let me ask big questions through philosophy, but then try to think about like, how do you even test this? Is this testable through psychology? And, and by the time I was done my undergrad studies, I uh, was advised more strongly by the philosophy profs that psychology was a better option for <laughs> career wise. And I was also sort of coming around to like, yeah, I'd like to actually be, you know, testing things in, in the world. Um, and I, after taking a kind of gap year to work as a research assistant, I ended up going to grad school uh, in an affective neuroscience lab where I could kind of study some of the the hardware, uh, as it were, that mm. that instantiates a lot of our mental programming while still keeping an eye on things like emotions and, and well-being and, and the feeling of, of the self and, and asking some of those uh, questions. And it wasn't until my first year of my, my PhD, so I did a master's year first studying just sort of, sort of how the body responds to our personality styles or our motivation. Um, but it wasn't until my PhD that I sort of got into thinking about meditation at all. Um, as I, I've said many times, I was the guy in the lab who did yoga when my uh, supervisor, Adam Anderson, forged a friendship or collaboration with Zindel Siegel, who's one of the developers of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And they decided that they were going to run a study on uh, what happens to people when they do mindfulness-based stress reduction, the most popular of the, the manualized uh, mindfulness training courses. And they were going to pay to do neuroimaging. And I had just been doing physio recording so far, and I really wanted to learn fMRI. So this was like a chance for the guy in the lab who does yoga anyway to maybe dip a toe into meditation research. Um, and uh, what I got out of it uh, initially, like the, the cell was like, you can, we'll pay to do an MRI study if you, if you learn how to analyze it. And that quickly became my entire PhD thesis and, and subsequent career. I'm still <laughs> referring back to the results of those first studies um, and planning what I do now. Um, and it wasn't really until I would say a couple of years into that endeavor when I was starting to actually see that mindfulness training was leading to differences in, in brain activity and in circumscribed contexts that I thought, oh, I should probably maybe try meditating to see what's going on and coming back to the mm. the kind of existentialist roots and sometimes presenting, you know, brain data and people asking, well, what was it like um, in the in the scanner for the participants? And I'd say, I don't know, like, I don't know what yeah. that, I, I'm just a benign skeptic. Uh, I'm, I'm not actually a practitioner. Um, and going to some of the Mind of Life summer institutes um, was really formative for me. I think I went to one right as I was getting, in, just beginning this work at the start of my PhD um, way back like in 2006 or seven. And there the Varela's idea of the scientist practitioner was, I would say, hammered into our, our skulls. It was like the one <laughs> thing that, that seemed like the organizers wanted us to come away with was this idea mm. that we should be practicing uh, personally, uh, in, in some sort of contemplative practice, and that should be informing our science, and vice versa, our scientific findings should be informing what we, uh, how we conceptualize, and how we're motivated to do contemplative practice. So I found that really rich, and it was a bit of that best of both worlds of like the engineering, hardware, and neuroscience side for me, uh, and but bringing back some appeal to get into the existentialist or, or phenomenological perspective of, of what it's like to be you and what what happens when you pay attention to your experience. And so that marriage really worked for me, even though it meant making up like all of our methods, because there wasn't like someone to follow necessarily. But 
um, before I knew it, like I was, you know, halfway through my PhD and just starting to publish from this fMRI study. And I was like, that's my thesis. And your thesis is your, your brand for better or for worse, unless you just walk away from it and start something new. Um, it sets the trajectory for, for what you're going to do next uh, when you're a graduate student. So um, I don't, I think it's, it was really an amazing conflation of, of opportunities that, that got me into this field and let me feel like I really found some kindred spirits here and, and that the questions excited me then and continue to excite me now. That's awesome. It sounds like a really great fit between your interests coming into this and then engaging with Francisco Varela's ideas and this whole space of of putting together first and third person, because it sounds like that's kind of what you were interested in all along the way. Mm -hmm. So you were really one of the first people to try to do this uh, from the neuroscience side. Um, your your paper, I guess it was from 2007. Is that the paper uh, that you were saying became your thesis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a really seminal paper um, at the time. And I remember it being the first time that I had ever seen anyone publish and speak about the self with meditation too. And I, it sounds like that was part of your interest all along. So do you want to talk a little bit about that paper since you said it has informed so much of your future work? Yeah, I mean, it's still the distinction of that, that paper, which is the idea that we can shift into a, a mode of relating to our experience that's primarily about sensory input. And that is important because it's not what we normally do. And it, that might actually take some practice to shift out of a, a mode of um, conceptual elaboration. We called it judgment at the time. I think of it now as almost just like an output mode, like that we're always trying to figure out how we, we're supposed to respond and to shift out, shifting from a place where you're trying to respond into actually taking in information, information that could change you. Um, it was like a radical kind of move. Uh, so I love that that idea that it's like a radical act. That's a John Kabat-Zinn uh, <laughs> phrase that really sticks with me as well. Um, that's still the game, right? It's, and and I yeah. think I'm really clear for myself, at least, that I, we're probably not going to discover like a new thing the mind does that no other human has discovered. It's more of a a question of of translating and um, sort of updating our our concepts to include um, what's essentially a fundamental human capacity, uh, and in some ways to correct um, for an imbalance that we currently experience where. Um, we spend our whole childhoods trying to occupy a mode of responding and acting like we know. And somewhere along the way, we um, we lose track of how to switch back into the sensing mode because we never had to learn how to be in that mode. We started in that mode um, where we knew nothing and, and we were just trying to find patterns um, in our experience uh, so that we could scaffold our way up and understand the world and how to survive in it. Um, so, and, and just last night I was watching with the kids, uh, Hook, uh, the Robin Williams, uh, sort of Peter Pan grows up and he forgets how to play. He's like this, like high tension lawyer and his marriage is in trouble and he doesn't have time for his kids. And it, it, it was really keeps showing up. Like every day it shows up. If you look for it, that like the hook in that movie, other than like Captain Hook's hook is the idea that it's really, really important to find a way to still experience play and still experience what it's like to be exploring and to not know and to not always have to respond. So mm. I would be fine never moving past that distinction as like the main thing that motivates me. And um, it was really amazing seeing the response to the paper. It, I mean, to be clear, like there were definitely architects in the generation of researchers before me, like Sarah Lazar doing stuff on longitudinal uh, brain structure, um, or Richie Davidson uh, studying long-term um, meditators. Um, but the idea of just taking people off the street and making them do some meditation practice and and seeing whether like an eight week training effect was even publishable, like we didn't know that at the time. But yeah, very quickly it it set precedent and really felt like it empowered or inspired, along with the other researchers working in parallel with me at the time, this kind of new generation of contemplative science, which has just been an awesome wave to ride. I love how you were just speaking about when we're very young and infants and we come into the world. And we're searching for patterns that will help us, you know, understand and navigate the world. Mm -hmm. And um, you've spoken and written so beautifully about predictive models of mind. And um, it's really helped me understand um, the relevance of those theories. So I was hoping we could dig into that a little bit and explore, you know, the models that we hold and then how we respond to sensory information coming in, whether it matches that model or not, um, so I think this has a lot of really interesting implications. 
Maybe just to start, could you share a bit more about how we build this model of the world and and the role of uh, sensory information? Yeah, I think the predictive coding model is de rigueur uh, it, these days, and uh, especially in systems neuroscience, uh, the idea that one principle could explain how a lot of the brain works, which is is just trying not to get surprised and trying to reduce not having a good model for what's coming in from the world. It, mm-hmm. You know, we just get nailed with sensory information and it's upsetting not to understand what's going on so and it's upsetting like at a physiological level like at a a basic like neural level it it creates a lot of activity and it's unclear how to resolve it so what our brains seem to do is try to find regularities or patterns um, in sensory information and we can then leverage taking a familiar set of inputs and almost predict what goes with those inputs when we start um, getting enough experience, right? Enough exposure uh, to the same thing happening. So, um, in the example of recognizing that, you know, there's a table in a room, it requires understanding that certain gradations of of light um, hitting our retinas uh, represent edges of of objects, and that takes a long time uh, to form, right? It, if you've been around young babies, they don't really know that there are objects for months. But it's not that they're doing nothing. They're just building a corpus of information to the point where um, they start to realize that there are certain familiar uh, familiar patterns within the sensory tableau. And over time, we build upon the inferences we make. So like a, an, an inference would be like, oh, there is a table there. Right? But before you can make a table there, you can say, oh, there's something darker there and something lighter around it. Um, and then, you know, oh, maybe there are actually edges here and oh, there, there are features, there are legs, there's a flat thing on top. And oh, this is the kind of thing that turned out to be a table last time. And so you're not doing this through language, but um, by making these inferences on, on sensor information, we learn how to package up um, sensory inputs and we automate that process. And so by the time you've seen your millionth view of a table or 10 millionth, I don't know exactly how many views and how to break up a moment in time, but now it's just a table, right? And then we do the same thing for understanding feelings in our body. And eventually we do the same things for understanding the broader world and, and how we fit in and, and how we should communicate to others is we just look for patterns and we get used to that that's the way things go. And we only pay attention really when um, something doesn't already match with our expectations. So it's sort of like expectations all the way down. Uh, and that's the predictive coding model of the brain from just even understanding where an edge is um, or what a color, what color is hitting the retina all the way up to like, was that action just or unjust? This is all about matching what the incoming information is compared to our model in, in similar contexts. And the contexts are also cued by their, their familiarity to past experiences um, and to do a, a comparison between, well, what do we expect to get in, in this kind of situation? Um, and what are we actually receiving? And to the extent that we're off, it draws our attention because we need to try to resolve that discrepancy so that we have an appropriate model for responding to the world again. Mm-hmm. We had a, a Mind Life think tank in, in 2015 where we wrote, a, or prior to 2015, in 2015 we published a paper talking about how there's two ways to stop being surprised by the world. Uh, one is to go address the causes of your surprise to so go try to fix things in the world or in your body you know you feel something you shouldn't you feel something in your stomach you take an antacid because your stomach ought not to feel that way and the other way which is the kind of contemplative way is to think like well maybe this is the way my stomach feels sometimes and not just like say that in a kind of gaslighting way like to tell to make yourself wrong for for being upset about it but to really be like yeah it's, it's okay sometimes that it, that it feels different and then that also takes away the surprise and the upset and the need to do something. So that, that's sort of the frictive coding model in a nutshell. And most of the time, what we talk about is, you know, self-regulation um, in terms of like, I'll take some overt action to resolve the discrepancy, right? If, the, if a sound is hurting my ears, I will try to plug my ears or move away from the sound or yell at the person who's making the noise or whatever it is because it ought not to be this loud it's not usually this loud and i'm uncomfortable with it um and what you kind of see as as we move from a you know children who are just constantly asking like what is this why what what is this mm-hmm. why like over and over again to adults where it's like you know um let me tell you what this is uh, like we try to move into this presentation as though our models are complete and 
certain phenomena like mansplaining is like <laughs> the need to always have a model and and you mm. need to prove that your model is good even when someone else isn't really asking what your model is <laughs> like let me tell you about the thing you're an expert in because my models are already complete um and the idea that we could still be updating our models is uh very similar to having a kind of a growth mindset that it's okay mm -hmm that your models are wrong. In fact, it's inevitable. Um, and so when you're upset by your model being wrong, sometimes you don't need to like beat the world back into shape, <laughs> and which is often like not just the physical world, but our social our social world. You could actually just try to learn something and, and learn that that's the way things go sometimes. And knowing whether to try to fix the world or to update your models for the world is the main game uh, mm -hmm. that we ought to be playing as human beings rather than getting stuck in one mode or another. Yeah. And I think we can see the kind of default tendency to just confirm the model, you know, just writ large on the world stage, you know, with political polarization, for example. And it's just if any contradictory information comes in about someone that you have put in a certain category, there's all sorts of ways of discounting that information. Is that another example of kind of how in a very social way we can keep confirming the model as opposed to um, being open to actually new information and potentially updating the model of the world. Yeah, and I, th I think it's a point of contention where um, one ought to push back against, mm -hmm. you know, model upsetting information versus consider updating the model. Um, so the idea that if someone is coming to you and not actually discussing something in good faith and they actually just trying to under undermine you and there's no way that they're going to ever change their own models, um, that might not be really a great time to just start updating, right? So it's like, who do you trust to even engage with as, as a, a source of information to potentially update your models? But, you know, it can go too far where you say, well, I'm never going to update my models because of those, those people aren't trustworthy. And then, of course, you will never be able to appreciate their model of the world. Um, so... Uh, you know, I think it's it's risky to lean too heavily either way. Um, and we see this this sort of conflict playing out right now as to, you know, should we even try to understand this person's point of view or not if they have a really different political attitude than I, for instance. So when it comes to the role of contemplative practice or meditation, you were saying before that maybe that kind of shifts our tendency to update models or incorporate, kind of pay more attention to these sensory information that's coming in. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe it's a radical proposition, but I, I would argue that every time you engage in a true act of, of sensation, an authentic act of sensation, you are letting yourself be changed by the world. And every time you respond, you're trying to hold yourself together and make the world change. Mm. And the idea that there's a skillfulness in, in letting yourself be changed and titrating, you know, how much sensation should I let in? Um, and also being selective in, in what type of um, information. And sensation isn't just like the feeling of, you know, the wind on my skin. Sensation is also like the language I subvocalize inside my head. That's also a, a sensory event. Uh, it's like the thoughts I have, right? The feelings I have. So what do we actually want to attend to and not modify? And in doing so, um, let it change us, right? By mm -hmm. we, we, We're either holding sensation as the thing that's not supposed to change, or we're holding the model as the thing that's not supposed to change. And we're always holding one of those two things. Um, and so contemplative practice is uh, one way to look at it, I think, is the art of of playing with, well, what are you holding? And can you let go of holding one thing and hold the other? Um, and the fascinating thing for us today is is that it's really, really hard to let go of the model. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it's a cartoon distinction, but this idea of like the default mode network uh, in the brain that um, tends to be most active when we're doing things that are most familiar to us, most habitual, shows us that the way we're wired is to move from a place of changing into a place of relying on models. It's sort of like in how built in that is, like whether human beings could be raised in a way where that the default network does not become the primary contextualizer of our environments and producer of our responses um, is sort of an open question that I don't think is going to be easy to answer. But what seems clear is that it's 
very, very easy for people to fall into reporting on the model and holding the model is the thing that that's important. And it takes some practice um, to let go of that a little bit and let yourself be changed and, and possibly, uh, you know, damage or knock up a few <laughs> models in the way and then have to integrate that and, and reconcile. Okay, so now now do I believe? What do I know? Who am I? And depending on, on what model is being uh, impacted. Yeah, I, I love that you brought up the default mode network because I feel like that is a, a brain system that comes up a lot in um, contemplative space and also in cognitive science. I'm wondering if it's accepted or generally thought now that the default mode network um, is the neural representation of the quote unquote model of the world that, that the brain is holding. Uh, well, I think yes and no. Like at, at every level of neural representation, there's modeling happening, and things only get sent further up the chain if the neural level um, gets surprised uh, as part of the sort of predictive coding um, models. But at, at the highest level, like at the whole system level, it seems like it's the, the default mode network. I know from personal experience, if you get someone to just start a new task in the scanner, that's easy. Like press one finger when the arrow is pointing left, press another finger when the arrow is pointing right. You get a lot of brain activity for like the first 10, 20 seconds, and then it kind of quiets down and the default mode network spins up as it becomes familiar and, and routine. Um, and as far as we can tell, like even basic physiology, um, you know, how your cortex responds to changes in, in need for consuming um, ox oxygen or, or other uh, metabolic resources. That stuff all needs to be deeply automated uh, to kind of keep us alive. And it seems to, you know, have some brainstem stuff happening, but also feed directly into um, the back parts of the default mode network. So, you know, saying like the huge swath of brain is just doing models is a mm -hmm. is sort of like slamming abstractions together but at the same time like i think it's a, a useful heuristic at least in, in comparing it to other brain networks to other big constellations of brain regions and uh and it leads to some interesting implications when we for instance we know that self-referential thought um is one of the few you know explicit tasks that you can do that will fire up the default mode network, whereas most other formal reasoning or effortful processes turn it off as you start to become engaged and do something that's a little challenging or, or less routine. So um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a nice foil for what uh, meditation may be doing in terms of either weakening the dominance of habit or um, creating communicative pathways into the default network that modify so it's not necessarily about like tear it all down, but like, wouldn't it be nice to be able to update your models? Um, so I think we're getting more nuanced than just like, you know, default mode network, like conditioning, and then that's bad. Let's let's get rid of all conditioning right. uh, into more more nuanced accounts of, of, well, what gets access to the network and what can actually feed in and influence the network rather than just be outputs of it. Yeah, I love this idea of the um, ability of these networks to incorporate more information and be updated. It feels like, you know, you were speaking earlier about it's not just that you dismiss new information and it's not just that you necessarily accept it without thinking about it, but there's a lot of discernment, right, that happens in in that space. And I think, as you said, that's really the whole game is, is when to do one or the other. And I'm wondering whether... Um, allowing more information in and maybe through practice, if that's what meditation is in fact doing, is kind of allowing things to be updated more easily that also makes space for that discernment. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's a, a bunch of things that happen in early meditation practice. Um, the first is just giving yourself a bit of space to notice things. And so that is really um, interfering with business as usual. And it was the first, it's the thin edge of the wedge for meditation in the West was the relaxation response, like Herbert Benson um, being like, hey, you know what happens if you if you really focus on something for a while that's not like, you know, just business as usual, like your whole body just kind of like relaxes. Like, isn't that weird? Probably good for you. Like, here's a book. So like in the 1950s, this predates MBSR or anything like that. You know, we have the relaxation response. And I really think you know, the idea that like it's not linear is in, in contemplative practice is, is true, but there's a reason why certain practices are laid out in, in the way they are across a, a variety of traditions. And there are certain, um, let's say, like trends in, in terms of what has to happen first. And so by attending to sensory inputs, you in a, in a somewhat, you know, a definitely intentional way and somewhat effortful way, um, 
you really are pulling resources away from the habit network, from the default mode network, if we're going to to load it up as being where habit, habits are instantiated and expressed. Um, so that's a really important early step. Uh, we're not talking about any kind of like higher level discernment, like a moral judgment on, on purpose, because that gets really complicated. It's more like, can you even discern when you're sensing versus when you're back in the model mode? And can you get some skillfulness uh, in efficiently moving back to sensing when you realize the model took over again, right? Because it's it's the dominant um, force. Um, so that'd be like really early uh, practice uh, is just giving it, because over time the dominance of the, of the default mode network will start to um, decrease as it starved from resources by the act of attending to sensory information. Um, and then things get really interesting because now you can, uh, now you have a little bit of space where you're not just elastic banding back into habit every moment. It might maybe every other moment, two out of three moments, but you have these little moments where where you're not just sucked in back into the narrative gravity of, of what's familiar. Um, and then in that space, now you can make some, you know, truer choices around what to attend to in a way, um, which of course will be still motivated by your, your past experience, but you can do something different than the most obvious thing in terms of where you attend. And now, now there's a chance to notice things that you don't expect, right, in this place where you don't. And, and from there, um, you can scaffold on, like you can develop a model for noticing things that you didn't expect, right? So you're still model building. And from there, you could notice not just like physical sensations that are, are unexpected or you're at least open to whatever is coming, but you could notice feelings, thoughts, interpretations, judgments, meanings, um, and sort of work your way up from there. Um, but the idea of, of discerning and selecting, like, is this the kind of thing I'm trying to notice um, and am I going to keep turning back to it um, becomes a much, it becomes, a, it becomes an everything game, right? You can pick what, what you want to uh, forage for is a, a term we're using more and more uh, as Indal and I had kind of workshop these ideas. Like you can, you can start foraging for particular things. Um, and we really like the term foraging because it's, there's no guarantee you're going to find it and you don't even know exactly what it's going to look like, but you're out there sort of like, I wonder what's out here. Like, I wonder if there's opportunities to notice like playfulness or kindness or um, another way to solve this equation or whatever it is. You can forge for whatever you want, though, uh, you know, of course, people are influenced by the traditions they're, they're trained in as, as what the likely targets should be. I feel like a lot of your work has, since the beginning, focused on the body and sensations of the body, which is a, where a lot of uh, meditation practice begins. Mm-hmm. Um, There's a process that's often referred to as interoception uh, in the research field. So uh, I'm wondering how you think about how that plays into all these things we've been speaking about. Yeah, I think it's still an open question whether interoception or awareness of what of the body's internal state, um, which you know includes the basis for for feelings or emotions, um, is privileged in a way above other sensory targets. Like, could you just do a, a visualization practice or a listening practice? And clearly, there are traditions that are don't begin with with the breath or the body, right? It's it's just the the mindfulness you know, uh, tradition, the, those, those sutras start with, with the breath. And so I, I think on, on one hand, the ability just to like break out of the habit network and get into a place of not defending your model, but defending the ability to take in information, um, uh, that could be done with any sense modality. Um, but then as I was trying to point out before that there is something very special about interoception because that's where we can see our, our conditioned emotional uh, responses, right? We can see um, the arising of the the feeling uh, tone that is thought to accompany every sense percept, every moment of sensation, every little bit of sensation has like a little bit of like, ooh, <laughs> this looks good, or like, oh, I don't know about this. And, and that's deep conditioning that is relevant for our, our sense of well-being and and purpose and safety uh, in the world in a way that 
noticing like, oh, this is what it's like when the table ends and air begins, doesn't have that same type of um, conditioning that is bent towards self-relevance or is our, the feelings we get are all about like, what should the organism do in response to this sensation? Um, so there's something really rich there. But, you know, we've done studies uh, a while ago uh, with a graduate student, Thomas Anderson, you know, where we give people three different types of, of meditations, uh, a breath focus, a uh, visualization and a, a auditory, like sort of mantra practice and ask them which one they think they'll prefer. And then they do each one for five minutes. And, uh, and then we ask them, okay, how was it? Which one do you prefer now? And like half of everyone switches, doesn't matter where they start. So people don't even really necessarily know like what they're primary access point is and this is only after five minutes so maybe things switch in a more predictable fashion like after you do it for a few weeks or months but these are just access points to getting into this kind of sensory foraging state where you really are shifting yourself into an input state but the types of insights when you get to like what i call like stage two meditation like now you can get into the sense state and i'm not going to give you 10 stages or anything but let's say there's at least two stages like a quieting down of habit and then like a looking around the types of things that you can notice when you look around are probably really dependent on what you're paying attention to and to the extent that you're doing meditation to understand your own conditioned aversion or craving or um, what's running sort of behind the scenes emotionally there's something really really important about the body that it would be very hard to um, you'd, be, you'd be seeing it at least in like one order removed to understand like how your your vision is is literally colored by some kind of deeper conditioning or your hearing um, if anything the things you might notice then that are self-relevant are like your impatience or attitude so like the internal feeling state that's still arising even though you're ostensibly focusing out in the world and we have some like pretty cutting edge i guess neuroimaging findings that suggest that there really are these kind of two stages that everyone can when they get into kind of sensory absorption um particularly of body sensation in this this particular study i'm, I'm referencing it's, it's breath monitoring um there is a massive uh, deactivation of a lot of the conceptual elaboration parts of our brain even when mm. it's uh, compared to a very closely matched visual target uh so comparing vision to to breath monitoring that is not as i just got to run some more control analyses but as best as i can tell at this point it's not just predicated on like breathing slower or deeper or something like that that's just affecting brain chemistry um turning inside is like a bit of a sensory deprivation chamber uh where like feelings and other things uh might be seen in, in higher contrast um Mm -hmm. In that study, actually, we don't see activation of like interoceptive regions. What we just see is a lot of the other parts of the brain that are probably also contributing signal, contributing noise um, uh, and, and contributing to awareness are quieting down because, of course, mm -hmm. the body must always be representing itself to keep your heart and, and your breathing and your blood pressure and all those things within safe boundaries. And, and so uh, the idea of getting out of your own way um, to notice some of that stuff seems like it might be playing out in, at a neural systems level that to pay attention internally is actually a more radical act of quieting down than much else. And, and then what happens is that people with higher expertise or comfort or trust in, in body sensations, we use um, Wolf Mailing's uh, scale, the, the Maya, the multidimensional assessment of interoceptive awareness, to look at people's comfort and and trust in body sensations higher scores on the maya suggest a, a sparing of a total like cortex shutdown and you keep some of the salience network the anterior cingulate this sort of monitoring discerning faculty alive even while a lot of other things are shutting down so it's mm. it's um, getting into this kind of quieter space and and then in this sort of low energy mode still being able to discern things that's something that's really i think somewhat unique about breath monitoring at least compared to to visual attention yeah so to answer your question i think there is something really cool about sensory attention in general but there may be something privileged about internal awareness um, for some of the reasons i i enumerated before but it's still a work in progress to, to show that that's really like a, a valid distinction i'd say yeah yeah I'm wondering too, I know you've done a lot of work around depression and I feel like there's a complex relationship to internal bodily states and the ability to sense one's own body in depression. Um, just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Has that been explored? Is there a difference? In depression vulnerability? Yeah, in, in depressive states with interoception. 
I mean, <laughs> it's a huge field, of course. Uh, yeah. one of the, it's the leading, it will be, I think, if it's just getting to being the leading cause of disability around the world is, is depression and depression symptom burden. Mm. It's a huge field. Um, we know from like resting state MRI that um, depressed people tend to show a sort of out of control prefrontal pattern of activity. This is Yvette Chilin's work. And so you end up seeing networks that are supposed to kind of like push against each other, all activating at the same time. So it's like the default mode network is, you know, firing at the same time as the planning, like control executive network mm. so that you can like bear down and think even harder about why your life sucks kind of thing. And then you're noticing how bad it is at the same time. So the salience network uh, to complete the trio of major prefrontal networks are all being co-activated and this created this kind of dorsal nexus hypothesis of of depression this place where these three networks should all have like well-ordered fences in a way um the, the storm came through ripped those fences out and now your habit is to attend to your thoughts about your depression and then to notice how bad it is in a in a constant cycle and i think that's the dominant view on depression is that it's a problem of of model implementation of, of model defense uh, it's a prefrontal problem and uh, yeah, this whole other stream of, of my work that does tie into interoception was was this discovery that while all this is going on, in the same way that paying attention to sensations might starve the default network, might starve these prefrontal networks of, of metabolic resources in depression, and even in like the local response to seeing something sad, even if you're not particularly depressed, in pushing so much effort into understanding and, and modeling and figuring out, well, what does this mean for me and all this stuff, we are actually starving resources from our sensory networks. Mm. Um, and from the studies that, that I've been a part of, it's actually how much the sensory or sensory motor parts of the brain are turning off in response to a negative emotion. That's really predictive of uh, long-term vulnerability to depression or concurrent depressive symptoms or uh, the scars of past episodes of depression. Everyone is turning on the front of their brain to understand and, and, and unpack their sadness. Um, but not everyone is doing that to the exclusion of still letting new information in to the same extent, even though we all turn away a little bit um, from our senses when we feel bad. And so it's the difference in the turning away that is actually most health relevant, uh, at least in, in the context of depression and vulnerability. Um, it's not the fact that we ruminate and, and get a little, you know, self-evaluative and, and uh, delve maybe uh, unintentionally into, into related memories and things like that. Like that actually seems, it sounds like something that both healthy and unhealthy people do, but to do it to the exclusion of letting new information in is what's pathological. And so we've just published the first neuroimaging paper from a really big clinical trial in remitted depression where we showed um, that it's the somatosensory cortex, which is sort of like the hairband on top of your head that has a map of your body and a bit of the motor cortex, which is a, an output map to go along with the input map, turning off that is um, most related to past episodes of depression, uh, residual symptoms in people who are now remitted from those past episodes and future vulnerability over the next two years. Um, not so much what the, the front of the brain is doing. Uh, and very few people are talking about non prefrontal cortex affecting the amygdala, like, you know, the, the emotional salience detector uh, accounts of depression. It's all very front of the brain centric. But uh, there are starting to be like large, like data driven studies of depression that are now starting to point out that it's some of these other connections, maybe to sensory regions, maybe to motor regions that are actually the best big brain system indicators of, of depression or depression and vulnerability. It's not just about, you know, the threat detector firing too much or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So things are maybe slowly shifting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And also then points to um, what we were speaking about earlier if the role of meditation is to maybe try to help learn to integrate or pay more attention to sensory information, that's a kind of a whole other lens on why certain kinds of meditation might be helpful for depression, which has been shown a lot and is actually one of the first realms that you got into this field about, right? Yeah, for sure. And it's sort of like a, an understandable but ironic consequence of people's attempts to deal with their negative emotions is to say, well, I'm going to turn away from feeling because the feeling feels bad and I'll just try to understand it and understand the conditions that arises and what I have to do about it. Because all of that planning and interpreting is safer for me right now than feeling the bad feeling that led me to get into all this planning and elaborating. 
um and so the irony is by doing that what you've essentially done is locked yourself in a room with your depression thoughts because now you're staying away from feeling and feeling is as i said before sensation and, and the feelings that arise out, out of that is literally how the world changes you. So you are you don't feel good, so you shut the doors and you stay in the room just with the knowledge that you don't feel good. But then the question is like, well, what's the exit strategy? You're like, well, I'll feel better again. Like, how will you know? You won't know because mm. you're, you, you're afraid that it's just gonna be more depression at the door. And so it is unsafe to open the door again. It is literally unsafe, but like in a delicious way uh, in that, yeah, you may no longer be safe in knowing that you're depressed. Like that's really threatening to your ability of knowing what's going on and having a model. Your model might get kicked down by the fact like, what does it mean about you if you are if you identify as a depressed person and you feel great one day? Like here you have to rebuild your whole identity. So I think it's uh, understandable um, that people get stuck by trying to protect themselves from feeling. But if that's your problem, I'm not saying all, you know, sometimes people feel depressed because something really bad is happening in the world and just feeling it more isn't gonna fix it. But for people who are depressed because they're locked in this kind of echo chamber of their own making to avoid feeling more, and, and that tends to be the case, the, the more often you become depressed, the less it, it tends to be related to a, a, a major life catastrophe. For those people learning how to let sensation in and letting it be not safe and letting their ideas about themselves and the world in the future get knocked up a little uh, by a sensation that doesn't care that that's what the model is and might disrupt that model is beautiful and necessary. Mm. And so, yeah, contemplative practice is ideally, I think, learning how to do that safely. And they should be adapted and titrated for, for clinical situations where the level of conditioning in response to sensation may be uh, really different and, and much more intense than the average practitioner has to deal with. Yeah. Um, well, you just touched on the kind of central piece of ident our core identity, right? And in that case of depression, it's um, it's really difficult to have that challenged and maybe have to rebuild that. I'm wondering, your original study was also related to the self and the way that we think about the self, Um either in the moment or in this kind of narrative storied way. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering just how you've come to think about the self in this whole space with contemplative work and, you know, predictive models and habit systems and all of that. I've come to think of the self as the, the current model, like for life, the universe and everything sort of that we're walking around with. And it's continuously being constructed uh, in response to both the context that we physically inhabit our, our environment um, and in response to the imagined context, right? The things we're remembering or expecting or imagining. And it is not reasonable to think that we would be better off without a model. So the idea of like that we're trying to get rid of the self uh, completely is, I think, a misunderstanding. And even like the terms like, you know, anatta, like no self, like it's, it's it, the self is an illusion is, is not to, is not the same thing as saying that we would be better without it. That's actually like a, a, a near miss, right? A near enemy, I think of right understanding of, of this whole enterprise. The questions that are maybe more useful or skillful to ask is what are the dominant types of patterns and in, in perceiving and responding that characterize this model right now, that the self right now, um, if I could, would I choose them for myself? Uh, because they've already been chosen for me. <laughs> and then uh, if the answer is yes, it's like the Nietzsche sacred yes, like right on, like do it over and over again forever. Um, but when you find a place where, where the model isn't working and understanding that the model's job is to perpetuate itself, you know, what can you do to to leverage a little bit of plasticity in that model and update it? Um, and so it is probably the the fundamental question we're always, again, grappling with is, is you know, is the model good right now and should I let it ride? Um, or should I challenge it in some way? And contemplative practices are one access point of perhaps many um, by which to challenge and, and update these models. Um, so I don't know if everyone walks around thinking that they're responsible for the health of their big model, their self model in the same way that we might think like I'm responsible for how flabby my abdomen is getting, right? Like I think there was a, a bit of a revolution in the late 70s and 80s where we started saying like, hey, your physical health actually matters a lot. 
and there are things you can do about it, like you as an individual can do about it. So you, we all need to start being a little bit more responsible. And then, you know, gyms and yoga studios and uh, nutrition and all that stuff. Like if you <laughs> woke up one day in like the 1970s, like, none of that stuff was there like it's I think it's hard for us to imagine I mean right. it's not that no one understood fitness was important but the idea that like everyone has a individual duty to curate their their physical fitness uh, to the best of their abilities I, I don't think was really endemic uh, even like you know 50 years ago um, and the the promise of the modern sort of contemplative movement is what if people also thought they were responsible for their conceptual models or their big model like their self right um and the only way you can hold people accountable or responsible for for something is if they have the power to affect it um and so the reason why the contemplative uh movement has a chance to raise this level of responsibility is that it offers to empower people to update their models um and if now you know that you could update your model and it, it would have a big impact on your well-being or, or well-being of others around you and you have the tools like the technologies of self to borrow a term from from michelle foucault we have these technologies of self where we can update our models so it, it does make a difference and you can make a difference uh, somewhere along the way it comes like well you should make a difference then mm. <laughs> and then that's the idea of us sort of like getting to another level of maturity um and, and realizing that we are in some way responsible for how we perceive things and for how we re react to things. And yes, we inherit all this conditioning, just like I inherit a certain physical body uh, from my ancestors. Um, I inherit my social body, my myself, my model uh, from my culture and, and my ancestors. But I'm also responsible for what I do with it. And I ought to be taught and empowered to affect it. And then I ought to use that power uh, to make life better um and then who you're trying to make it better for is again a, a contentious topic and, and whether there's a natural slide into caring about others once you are good at taking care of yourself um i think is still an open question You've been in this field uh, pretty much as long as anyone thinking about the brain and meditation. And there, I think, have been a lot of shifts within neuroscience and cognitive science, moving from thinking about individual brain regions as having certain functions to a much more kind of distributed processing model. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that understanding hasn't necessarily filtered into the media and representations and the public understanding of, of how brains work. So I feel like um, just curious how you are thinking about or how you tend to describe localization of functions in the brain these days. Um, like you mentioned, people are still talking a lot about prefrontal and amygdala relationships in depression. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm just wondering how you're thinking about that. Yeah, I think the more universal the thing is, the safer it is to localize it. Um, and by universal, I mean, like, if you grew up in the jungle, you would still be able to do it. Like, it probably has a pretty solid set of regions um, responsible. So things that are safe to localize are like where different sensory inputs first hit the brain, right? Like primary representation cortices. Yes, of course, there's going to be the odd, you know, mutation or accident that where things have to restructure, but everyone gets vision, right? In the back of the occipital lobe, in the back of the brain, everyone smells things through little bulbs hanging down like way up where, where a COVID swab goes. <laughs> so primary representation of, of sensory afferents, so signals coming from the world or from our bodies and into the brain, those all hit exactly the same places. Uh, similarly, the things that keep you alive, like, uh, and keep all mammals alive, like in the brainstem, um, and those nuclei tend to be pretty, pretty safe. And the same is also true on the output side, right? So the, the motor map that matches up with the somatosensory map in terms of like how you send signals back out into the spinal cord, given that we all have roughly the same kind of shape bodies and skeletons and number of limbs and things like that that stuff is really safe to localize right um it's really safe uh, other things that are fairly universal is are like being able to encode and and uh, retrieve memories so the machinery for doing that like in the hippocampus or the ability to detect if something motivationally relevant 
is in the field of your experience, like the amygdala and the salience network, like but the amygdala as a as an early warning system, those seem fairly fairly safe. And then as soon as you have to learn something, like as soon as you have to start doing model building, that scaffolded on top of that, all bets are off, right? Mm-hmm. And so can you in an individual figure out like what the representational pattern is that distinguishes looking out in the world versus in at your breath? Totally. And we have uh, some other stuff and other, other researchers have done like, you know, machine learning to prove the information is there in the brain, but it's not in the same place for every person. But there are still some like generalities and that's led into this, you know, golden age of of network neuroimaging to say that there are parts of the brain that tend to talk more with each other because they're sensible scaffoldings on the sensory representations. So like the default mode network, um, probably because it starts off with habits of of homeostasis of physiology and then sort of scaffolded itself up to more abstract habits like Occupy is very consistent territory, the salience network, because it responds directly to you know, the proximal alerting sensory signals tends to have the same kind of general territory. The higher cognition, planning and goal executive sort of network tends to occupy, um, you know, the same kind of general territory. We know that these networks kind of must be in play in a way because we need to be alerted to things. We need to know whether we can rest on habit or, or, or develop a new kind of intentional plan. Um, but they won't be the same for each person. And I think actually a really big paper came out this week that I haven't read in depth that that actually documents the variability in brain, not just structural mor- morphology, but functional morphology, like uh, activation that shows that there's a huge variety in exactly where these networks will be mm-hmm. in attempts to to say, oh, I found the region that does X if, as if it's not like a, a completely universal type of experience, like, you know, recognizing color from the visual field or something. Uh, and even that's, that, that's not totally universal, but, you know, mostly universal. Um, that's sort of fallen out of favor, right? It's more like, can we see these broad uh, sort of trends um, in these associative or learned uh, um, networks? Um, and can we um, in particular see like the, the trade-off between which of these networks tends to be dominant at any time without worrying about exactly where its boundaries are, that's become a lot more popular in, in trying to match up particular ways of relating to experience with networks is is somewhat reminiscent of like the sense judge, like narrative experiential self-distinction, but like taken to a much like a whole brain level and not just like mm. looking at this one one distinction. Yeah. So that sheds light maybe on what we know about meditation and its effects on the brain and whether those are consistent or not. So what's your sense of that space right now? I know there was recently a big paper um, that was not able to replicate any consistent structural changes after an MBSR course. But then, of yeah. course, there's always papers that do find changes. So how do you make sense of that? Yeah, there's a lot of things going on. Um, anytime you experience something that's new or different, your brain has changed and you don't, it's not useful to like say, I need to wait to see a brain scan to prove to me that, that that's changed, right? Every every moment of experiencing something is either strengthening or weakening, you know, trillions of connections across the brain. Um, so the idea that like there's a, a certain threshold and then neuroplasticity happens is just like, it's a, a false um, idea. Um, so of course the brain is changing, uh, after every meditation program. And of course the brain is changing after every banana you eat and every time you stub your toe and every time you cry at at a really moving piece of art, like, and every time you just fall back into habit, the brain is also changing. So, so he's saying like the brain is or is not changing in response to X, I think are not very interesting. Um, more interesting, I think, or more on, on point is the idea that there's been quite a few papers showing that there might be regular players and in, in what's changing with meditation practice. And I think if we were able to, you know, characterize beforehand exactly which parts of the brain are reacting in, in this particular context and tested that context after meditation, we would probably be able to see some, uh, some systemic changes um, on the functional level in terms of brain metabolism and on the structural level. Um, But at the same time, I got to say, like, seeing a different paper come out every year that talked about a different set of brain regions in response to, like, an eight-week intervention, to me, was sort of reeked of false positive um, psychology. And, And I would say that in my own lab, I've found many little bits of statistically significant brain changes in different places sometimes and just not felt confident 
enough to try to report them. It, it might just be that um, in our zeal to discover things, the, the consensus standards for saying we found something that's unlikely to occur by chance, uh, those standards are too low is probably true. But that's a thorny issue because we would have to re restructure the entire incentive system in, in academia and beyond to reward people for not finding things. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, you pay people to find things and you and you reject them for not finding things. It's not a surprise that everyone and not just the researchers, but also the editors and then the, the public who can, and the media and, and agencies who consume the, the proceeds of science are all biased towards only caring about the things you find, right? Um, and so is any one paper, a couple of papers that say, oh, this is the one part of the brain that changes its meditation. Is it, is it likely that they've outstripped their reach and, and said that this generalizes to all people, but it might've just been true of a couple of people in, in the sample who showed a really big effect? Yeah, that's probably true. Does it mean that meditation wasn't changing their brain? No, it meant that that was the best way, that was the best model for characterizing what happened to that group in that study. Mm -hmm. uh, and as someone who's led, you know, a handful at least of, of MBSR full eight week courses myself and been a participant observer and, and a participant in, in MBSR and, and mindfulness based cognitive therapy and some other courses, every program works different. And if you try to catalog what people are getting out of a program, we, I did a study with older adults because uh, I was a postdoc at a, at a geriatric hospital uh, for, for three years um, before getting a faculty position. Um, you know, you ask 10 people what the course was about and what they got out of it, you might get 10 different answers. And yeah. if you had a profile for that type of brain change and you matched it up with the answers and had like a real rich, like neurophenomenology and also like a much more extensive corpus of information around like what each type of change looks like in the brain, you might actually be able to match it up. And maybe that'll happen in the next 10 years. It'll be like, here's like five common outcomes of meditation. The models fit way better when we divide the group effects into five substrata and match them to people's experience um, than if we just assume it's it's one size fits all. So science in general has a, a problem in rewarding when you find things and also rewarding when you find like the universal thing. Um, mm. And if one person is using meditation to fall asleep at night and someone else is using it to renegotiate the relationship with their estranged son and someone else is using it to find deep metaphysical insights and someone else is using it to appreciate like the beauty of the outdoors more, uh, I, I think it would it would be weird to predict that they would all experience the same changes through their practice. So I, I don't think it's, I'm just not that bothered by these kinds of things. I think they're sort of like, it's like gotcha journalism. Like, yeah. oh, but you said you did this thing on the 17th, but it turns out you took the trip on the 18th. And, and it's just like, okay, but who cares? Like, so uh, I'm not too worried about that. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's more important to try to understand like why one size doesn't doesn't fit all and then also even ask like does it matter which part of the brain changes if someone is reporting that they've had this big experience um is that like a the most important question to ask i think a lot of people are more interested in at the time someone shows up to you and they're suffering like how you could figure out like well what the right type of training or what type of reconfiguration that would actually help this person would be. Um, and, and I think maybe that's the promise of, of studying these kind of big changes across groups is like now if we know that that's the process, I wonder if we could go back to baseline with a new group of people and then say like, hey, you're deficient in this thing that that, that will be, would be corrected by a process that we can reliably produce. Um, and that's like the holy grail for, for clinical science in general. We're still really bad at matching people's baseline conditions to appropriate treatments. Yeah, that was really well said. Thank you for all of that. I wish you could speak directly to the media on a lot of those points. <laughs> well, this has really been wonderful. Thank you so much, Norm. Um, I'm so glad that you've followed your initial passions and you've given so much to this field. So yeah, thank you for all of your work and thanks for taking the time today. Thanks for having me. It was really fun to chat. This episode was edited and produced by me and Phil Walker. And music on the show is from Blue Dot Sessions and Universal. Show notes and resources for this and other episodes can be found at podcast.mindandlife.org. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share it with a friend. And if something in this conversation sparked insight for you, let us know. You can send an email or voice memo to podcast at mindandlife.org. Mine and Life is a production of the Mine and Life Institute.
visit us at mindandlife.org, where you can learn more about how we bridge science and contemplative wisdom to foster insight and inspire action towards flourishing. If you value these conversations, please consider supporting the show. You can make a donation at mindandlife.org under support. Any amount is so appreciated, and it really helps us create this show. Thank you for listening.